zwischen uns und Ihnen. Das ist der Titel eines Vortrags, mit dem Matti im Juni hier in Berlin sozusagen äh, bei uns angefangen hat, in einer Reihe äh, des DIAG, Deutschland, Israel, Palästina zusammen denken und die wir dann in diese Reihe der kleinen Texte gebracht haben. Da erscheint so alle zwei, drei Monate ein kleiner Text, das ist jetzt äh, 84, wir sind so bei 90, ähm, ein bisschen was liegt da hinten zum Anschauen. Reißt die Mauern ein zwischen uns und Ihnen, ähm, damit sind wir, was Israel und Palästina betrifft, ganz dicht dran. Aber wir wollen ja nicht nur über Israel und Palästina, we won't only talk about Israel and Palestine. Um, but of course, behind all this, Arab Jew, Jewish Arab, schon die Frage, wie wir das ins Deutsche übersetzen. Ein arabischer Jude, ein jüdischer Araber, haben wir beides groß. Wir sind in der Debatte an einem der Gedichte von Matti in der Übersetzung. Schreiben wir da ein jüdischer Arabe, ein arabischer Jude? Schreiben wir beides groß? Oder das eine klein, das andere groß? So, you understand enough German to get already a hint from what I'm talking about. So what are you? A Jewish Arab in Berlin? An Arab Jew? In, is yeah. that something which it's speaks to you? What do I, what do I be for? I, we never thought about it, and I don't think we also paid attention when we uh, started our project. And, and I think, you know, in Israel, or like when I talk to people from Israel, I always say Jewish Arab. So I always present the Jewish identity first. And I wonder if this might change when we are Kabbalah right? So, and, and I think, you know, when I walk around in Berlin or in the European sphere and I Arabic so when I talk to people in Arabic and they ask me where I'm from, I don't start with where I'm from, I start with where my parents are from as the opening. And it's interesting because I don't start with Jewish, I start with, well, my mom is from Iran, my dad is from Syria, and then I say, but I'm from Israel, born Jewish. You know, so like there's this stage of introduction, and I think it's really interesting because A, it opens up some space for conversation that would have been closed immediately if I would have just said Jewish Israeli, right? Like it wouldn't, it won't, it won't be something against, but it just wouldn't leave any room for, you know, the moment that people hear in Arabic that I'm Jewish, you know, my father's from here, they're like, what? And then they start asking questions, and then a conversation can start. Um, so it's interesting. I don't, I wouldn't, I cannot tell you what I would always put because I also sometimes I play with it. Sometimes I say I'm from Palestine to see, you know, because <coughs> it is, Israel is Palestine, right? Um, in, in my book, like in my uh, academic book, I always wrote Israel slash Palestine, I never had Israel alone. Because I think it's also, like, there's something there that needs to be acknowledged, and there needs to be, and the, the Jewish Arab identity is really interesting, because it's, a, it's an identity that is not spoken of. It's completely like, and there's something important in putting it out there, and making people ask, What do you mean by Jewish Arab or Arab Jewish? What is behind it? And I think um, this is the important part because we are opening a space for a conversation, for asking questions. Um, Hila, you, I know that you just came back from the States, from the States, from the United States of America. Would you have said the same explanation there as here? I would have said exactly the same, but it wouldn't require um, a bit of a different approach. And there's a lot of, like, where I was, there's a lot of Jewish Americans. And they are not Israeli, and not all of them also support Israel. So it's, it's interesting kind of, and a lot of them know about the Mizrahi identity. So there's a lot of, a lot of Sephardic Jews did met, arrive eventually to the U.S. Uh, there's a very big, I was in, in Boston, there's a very big Syrian community in Boston, and there's a very big uh, Jewish Iranian community in L.A. So there's People are more aware of these like identities, I would say, actually, than in Israel. Like, it's more celebrated, I would say, than the you know, here in Germany. The Ashkenazi identity is everything that there is. It's almost there isn't anything else. And I think in the U.S., because also a lot of Arab Jews immigrated from Israel when it was so difficult to succeed and to flourish. Um, like for example, my father had to 
change his name in Israel in the 70s because his name was Arab. And an Arab what was name, his name? Abbas. And his Arab name was just something that for him was like, oh, like they, they might not take like his job. Abbas. Like Mahmoud Abbas. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of, yeah. And also the, this idea of like, if you see his first name is completely a Jewish Hebrew name, but his last name is an Arab name, and then questions not in a good way would rise up, right? Um, so there's, there hasn't been a research about it, but there's a lot of people saying that in the 70s, a lot of Arab Jews or Muslims actually left Israel to the US where they would not be anymore this, under this discriminator identity of like the, the people from the Arab countries. Because um, in the US there were so many foreigners from so many other countries that they were not the one in the lowest step. So, so here for Berlin or for Germany, you for sure get another little uh, mosaic, a little stone of that mosaic. Because, uh, if you see, we, most of us may have followed in the last days uh, how even the Jewish Museum here is attacked um, uh, from the Israeli government, and they are already anti-Israeli in their perception. So uh, we I'm have also attacked. <laughs> she That's I, I, what I want to, to, to yeah. come to. I mean, uh, coming here with an Israeli passport, with an identity of what? Of between um, and facing here a situation where with a very distinct understanding what a Jew is or what a Jew has to be and how his relation has to be to Israel. What does what does it do to you? Um, I think it's interesting because it's a continuance of what happens to people in Israel, right? So like what is interesting is actually that it continues, that the Israeli government will continue to I would say ambush or harass people that don't support her, even outside of the territory of Israel. And, and I think it's, it's fascinating to the extent of how this can take place in Germany uh, because of the strong relationship between the German government and Israel, the guilt of, of the Holocaust and everything that kind of led to a point where the Germans would just not, they would just accept a lot of stuff that the Israeli government would accept, ask them to do um, to the extent of canceling an event of a Palestinian speaker in the Jewish Museum without checking why or what is the identity of this person just because the Israeli ambassador asked that not to happen. And, and for me, I, I went to a really a ridiculous story, but there was a, an LGBT, an Israeli LGBT film event in Berlin, um, which I took to be, ah, okay, so it's for like, LGBT Israelis in Berlin, but also like LGBT Germans, and it sounded really nice. I wanted to see the films. I, of course, still identify as Israeli. I also identify as a lesbian. Went to see the film. Like, I registered because when you want to go to an Israeli event in Berlin, you have to give your name. There's a security check. Um, and it's interesting because there's a lot of people who already wouldn't go to the event just because they don't want to give their name to the Israeli authorities. I gave my name, and then when I got there, they told me that I cannot go in because I'm a security threat. Like, this was August, I was wearing a dress, and I like lifted my hands, and I was like, what security? I'm not carrying a weapon. I'm, like, and the only problem that they had, and I don't think it has anything to do with the Mizrahi identity or the lesbian identity, it was the, the identity of somebody who like says stuff against the government of Israel, not even... You know, like I'm not an outspoken person, I'm not part of an NGO or organization like a Palestinian people. But I just wasn't let in. So it's interesting how like the force of Israel and what is what you're supposed to do as an Israel outside of blood is still manageable, it like, still takes place in other territories. I mean we have chosen this the title of this lecture not by chance. Um the Mauern zwischen ein, zwischen uns und ihnen, um, da ist ja, sind ja ganz viele Mauern, there are a lot of walls, um, and you have obviously physical walls, but you have quite a number of more and more strict psychological walls. Right? What, uh, what is possible, what is impossible, um, what is allowed, what is not allowed, um, and who allows uh, to whom. Uh, so we are in the middle of, of something. Um, what would you say? is the significant contribution of an 
I say Arab Judaism, Arab Jewishness into this mosaic of German understanding of what Judaism is. I think first of all the most important part is that it, it with a German culture that is such a big supporter of the state of Israel and holds so much gratitude and, and guilt for the Jewish people, I think it first of all it teaches something about the the diversity of the Jewish people. So something that is a bigger, a little bigger than what is the Jews of Europe or the Jews from the Holocaust. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's an important information, not only for the German culture, but also for the, the Jewish people as a people, because it's another narrative that needs to be heard. And I think the more narrative that we have, it might be easier also to hear other narratives, right? So if you hear the Mizrahi or the Arab Jewish narrative, maybe you would also be able to hear the Arab narrative, the Palestinian narrative. Um, so I think mainly it's the most, imp the biggest importance of it is that it brings into being something that has been for years repressed and not discussed. Um, and for a reason that, like, I really, I, I cannot really say why. Why was it so oppressed inside Israel and why is it completely untouchable in Europe? Like, I don't understand that there are academics here who are doing like amazing work about the Africans and like, but the, the the Arab culture of the Jewish population is just not very much in the spotlight. And mm -hmm. so I think it's it's an interesting and, and also stuff can come out of it. And the moment that people talk about it and realize, um, I just read something really interesting about somebody in the U.S. Congress um, that she was just elected, and then she said she's from. She said that she realized only at a very later age that her family are the descendant of the, like the, the Jews of Spain. So, and she is only now kind of, and it's interesting because the, the discussion about this stuff can lead you to a lot of very interesting like, insights about not just you as a person, but your people and the country. I mean, this public confession has made it to a headline of the forefront yesterday. <coughs> the Times of Israel has had it today. Um, the confession of, of a new member of parliament as she had uh, as a black or pe person of color uh, being Jewish descendant um, makes it already out to something. That's right? already the middle of, um, of, the, of these realities. I mean, and those people from here who are Berlin by, by birth, let's say, if that is the term which is allowed, um, you would even say there is a neglect that um, there are quite a number of neglected Arab identities here. Who, for God's sake, has spoken about the Palestinians who came here in the 70s as yeah, the refugees from the Sur Lebanon? They are totally ignored, marginalized communities. And when you speak about this, you, you only, I only mention these, these criminal gangs and uh, terrorizing the city. That's the perception. People are living here for the uh, second or the third generation. And, uh, not, not only that. Them. Not only that, the Jewish community here made big crimes against the refugees here just because some of the organizers were in Palestinian separation. Uh, they canceled budget of seven uh, theaters in the uh, refugee uh, carnival that was here, <coughs> and this was the combination of all what you say together is showing how much crime is the influence of women that is made by some Jewish here to blame all the community of, the, of, of those that work for refugees with the German uh, supply, um, support from what happened and then some activists that were in other organizations supporting uh, um, uh, Palestinian and cut the budget of seven theaters. But it's not only a question of Jewish rumors. Uh, that works with uh, every political uh, uh, frame here. But Mawan, <coughs> War of the Gan, is quite a central theme. This term, which is quite popular, shrinking spaces, right? uh, which comes up in Israel very often. A lot of the left, of the rest of the left, um, is trading that um, what is possible, what is possible there, what is possible here. Um, so the question 
Um, is there here maybe something possible but it's not possible anymore? I think for sure, and I think mainly because of the problems of territories and borders, right? So like the, the, the possibility of me to sit with a Syrian or an Iranian in Berlin is an actual possibility. It's very oh, simple. But in Tel Aviv or in, <laughs> or in like, I, I cannot, with my passport, I cannot even fly to Iran. Right? So and there is, and they cannot come to Israel. So in order to meet people, I need to in Israel and have to leave the territory of Israel and create the interaction somewhere else. And I think yeah, there's something yeah. amazing about being here and staying here and being open to the possibilities that can come out of it. And, um, and again, like I really think that this, the meeting, the meeting is the, the option of sitting together around the table, drinking coffee, talking, can bring to a lot of stuff that when you ask people in Israel, <coughs> Let's see that um, again for German history we would have called it Drittlandsbegegnung. <laughs> First country meetings for those who have a, a historical memory, East and West Germans could only meet in Prague uh, or in Krakow or in Warsaw um, because that was a place uh, accessible for both sides. So you have this phenomenon again, and I remember when I started uh, walking right and left to Jerusalem. Israelis and Palestinians could only, not really, those relevant meetings could not take place there, we have to organize it somewhere, we are again in such a situation, but now we have to break down walls again, other walls, so um, let's see that things like that are little steps to uh, fighting against these shrinking spaces and trying to hammer certain walls um, here and there, so thanks for sharing.
der Mensch selbst kann entscheiden, ob er ist jüdische Araber oder arabische Juden oder jüdische Kurde oder Kurde aus Israel. Ich, ich weiß nicht, das sind irgendwie äh, Begriffe, die äh, mit Nationalität verbundene Begriffe, die man eigentlich äh, mehr kann arbeiten. Die Sprache ist oder die Begriffe sind so sensibel, die mh, vielleicht andere Bevölkerungen oder andere Menschen ausgrenzen äh, und äh, nicht in dieses Topf zum Beispiel äh, passen. Ja? Oder in der Küche nicht passen mehr. Ja? Unsere soziale Küche, die man nimmt. Ne? Äh, oder äh, äh, im literarischen äh, Bereich auch. Äh, gerade auf mh, ja, Mati, äh, ich freue mich, das erste Buch oder klein, erste klein Buch, aber sehr interessante Buch, als Manifest äh, als Theorie äh, und als Erinnerung, die ich habe da gelesen über äh, den Vater oder, oder die Mutter oder äh, über Israel selbst, die Städte der Akku oder, oder äh, äh, noch Helfer äh, und äh, die Situation der, der, der Juden aus Nahe Osten nach dem Verbot. Äh, äh, in Israel selbst, ja, äh, ist interessant und ist wichtig, ja, äh, aber wie gesagt, das ist der erste Schritt und wichtige Schritt, die man muss äh, oder soll einfach äh, noch, noch weitermachen. Äh, ich habe äh, vielleicht eine Mauer äh, gerissen mit Übersetzung, und das ist die beste Methode, die, die man äh, eigentlich äh, muss immer äh, Instrumente haben, die man irgendwie daran arbeitet, wie man die Mauer äh, reißen kann. Ja? Und äh, ich habe angefangen, äh, drei Texte mindestens von äh, Mati als Kurdische übersetzt. Und ich glaube, äh, ich mache weiter. Formate, ich habe auch für andere Autoren äh, aus Israel, aus hebräischen Raum, nenne ich immer, äh, übersetzt. Dann habe ich für, äh, wie heißt die Mati? Die Dame. Wie heißt die? Talizan. Talizan. Tal Tal ich habe äh, mehrere Texte übersetzt und ich habe erstaunlich in Nordsyrien auf Kurdisch veröffentlicht. Und das ist. Ich glaube, es ist nicht einfach, dass gerade in Syrien oder in Nordsyrien irgendwie für eine Autoren und so berühmte Autoren die Texte auf Kurdisch und in einer kurdischen Magazin veröffentlichen da. Wow. Ja. So, ja. Ich wollte auch noch mindestens eine Frage stellen. Ich meine, das war schon genug, da brauche ich eigentlich nicht viele Fragen gestellt. Aber äh, ich würde schon gerne noch mal fragen, ähm, du hast gerade die Küche, diese soziale Küche hier ähm, äh, angesprochen. Ähm, das ist ja auch für einen hier lebenden Kurden nicht so ganz einfach da den Schrank zu finden, wo das eigene Geschirr dann steht. Ähm, sag doch mal, wenn wir über diesen Nahen Osten reden, den ich Levante mal eben genannt habe, ähm, was, was hat das für dich hier in Berlin für eine Bedeutung? Ähm, also mit was für einem Gepäck, oder was machst du mit deinem Gepäck in dieser Stadt? Also, ja, dein Geschirr sozusagen, der Küche bleiben. Mein Gewicht ist, äh, ich glaube, ich äh, es voll mit Sprachen. Ich spreche fünf Sprachen. Ja. Alle Sprachen sind nicht perfekt, weil ich nicht, ich komme aus einem Sprachraum, der unterdrückt ist. Ich äh, rede über Sprachen und Unterdrückung äh, zwischen Sprachen selbst. Ja. 
Ich habe Arabisch mitgebracht. Äh, in der Schule gelernt, ich spreche Kurdisch, weil meine Familie Sprache ist. Ich äh, komme aus einer Familie, die Kombi-Familie ist. Aber nicht äh, noch Kurdisch dazu, noch, ich weiß nicht, andere Wurzeln, die ich bin immer noch auf der Suche auf die, die Wurzeln, die, die ich in meiner Familie habe. Ja, äh, vielleicht Jesiden äh, noch oder Juden aus Iran, ich weiß nicht. Ne? Äh, ich, konnte, ich konnte nicht genau mitbekommen von meinen Eltern oder Großeltern, äh, aber ich weiß genau, dass meine Großmutter von meiner Mutterseite, aber mehr aus jetzigen Türkei, in der Nähe vom Gebiet oder Mali. Ja? Leider, ich habe Arabisch nicht gelernt, weil sie selbst hat, äh, konnte nicht Arabisch. Äh, sie, hat, sie ist kurzierte, kurzierte arabische Vertriebene aus der Türkei. Ja, so. Ja? Und äh, dieses marginale Gruppen, marginale Gruppen, die, die eigentlich bis jetzt immer noch und äh, fast weltweit haben keine Anerkennung. Ja? Ich rede über Sprachen und über Menschen natürlich. Ja? So. In Berlin selbst, ja, ich habe mich sehr gefreut, dass ein kurdisch Projekt von Senat ja, oder äh, kriegt Stipendium, der kommt Stipendium auf kurdisch geschriebene Projekt. Das ist der erste Schritt vielleicht, weil die kurdisch, kurdisch Sprache in Berlin auch selbst ist nicht anerkannt und nämlich das einfach erweiterte Assimilation für uns und für unsere Kinder zum Beispiel. Ja, meine Tochter spricht Kurdisch, aber sie kann nicht schreiben und lesen. Ja, weil sie in der Schule selbst gibt keinen kurdischen Unterricht. Ja. Äh,